Hello, I'm Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. In this episode we will be reassembling the high voltage battery from our 2017 Chevrolet Bolt EV. You can see that sitting on the hoist here behind me. Also behind me we have the lower battery tray, we've got the battery sections, I've got tables full of uh, battery parts over here and we are going to completely reassemble this battery and get it ready to put back up in the vehicle. But as we reassemble it, we will look at as much detail as I've been able to find about the individual parts uh, and how they work and so on. So let's take a look at some groups of parts that we will put back in this battery. Okay, I've got the battery tray right here, the lower battery tray. This piece is a lot heavier than I expected that it would be and I guess it makes sense because it has got to provide some crush protection in the event of a side impact collision to keep the battery from getting uh, squished and then I think it also provides part of the lower structural support uh, of the vehicle. So I've got a scale right here, a crane scale hooked up. Let's lift this thing up and see how heavy this lower tray is. So I've lifted the lower tray. Uh, it says that it weighs 143.5 pounds, which is approximately 65 kilograms. So when we removed this battery out of the vehicle, I told you that it weighed 1,000 pounds. And as we can see here, about 143 of that uh, is the lower battery tray all by itself. While we've got the battery tray lifted up, let's look at a few things on the front here. We've got the opening here for our battery charger. When you plug in your level 2 or level 1 charger uh, to the vehicle, the DC current comes into here to uh, charge the battery. We've got our uh, coolant inlet, our coolant outlet. We've got a hole for our high voltage DC electrical connection. And then we have two holes over here for our low voltage uh, communication lines and controls and, and so on uh, internally to the battery. Okay, one last thing to look at on this tray real quickly is there's a drain plug underneath it right here in the front. This drain plug just opens up a drain hole for uh, inspection. And basically it's just like the Chevrolet Volt battery where there's an inspection hole where you take the bolt out to see if any coolant comes out. If coolant comes out, you know you have a coolant leak uh, somewhere inside and that you need to go in and see what's going on with that. Uh, if there's no coolant that comes out, uh, then that's how it should be. We don't want coolant coming out of there, but that's an inspection hole right there. Now, another thing to remember is that this battery was marked underneath with a center of gravity point. And that center of gravity point, if I rotate this battery around just a little bit, the lower tray, the center of gravity on this tray is about right here, right in the middle. Uh, it's between the one, two, the second and third major support going across. Right down the middle there is the center of gravity. And so when we set this on a lifting tool, lifting fixture, like this 2,500 pound lifting fixture I have underneath here, this uh, scissor jack, we want to make sure that that center of gravity is as close to the middle of the top of that lifting fixture as possible. So let's let this back down. Let it down slowly. Make sure we're centered. Okay, I received a lot of feedback on the disassembly video making fun of me for <laughs> using these uh, shop stools as supports for the battery. I just want to re-emphasize that the only thing these shop stools are doing is keeping the battery from tipping, the battery tray from tipping. The whole weight of the battery tray with everything inside of it is still supported by the lifting fixture underneath it. It's just that as we take battery sections out and put them back in, it's going to want to tip. And so that's the purpose of these no, they're not an official GM special tool, but I didn't see a procedure in the service information. But it's quite possible 
although I didn't see it, uh, that it's there, that it tells us to put it on the ground so that it won't tip while we're doing this. But I can't put it on the ground and still uh, work on it and reach it uh, for purposes of this video. So this is the, the best that uh, we can do here. Okay, we will be uh, measuring the weight of each battery section and I'll give you the, the dimensions of the battery uh, sections there also. But for now, let's go look at a few other groups of parts. Okay, right here, we have the cooling plates for this battery. I've reassembled the two pieces, the upper section here in the back with the lower section. And you can see the coolant transfer hoses, the three hoses there, we've got the two inlets on the outside and the return on the inside. We have the battery thermal mats, those white pieces that are there. And I have those covered up with plastic just to keep dirt and people from touching it uh, from contaminating those surfaces. And you can see our coolant inlet and outlet hoses here like we saw on the front of the battery before we disassembled it. So this is the cooling system for this. So this is the cooling system for this battery. Okay, on this table, I have all of the bracketry, the bolts, the orange bus bars that connect all the battery sections together, the battery energy control module with the cover off of it so we can see what's inside of there, the low voltage harness, the high voltage harnesses, the service disconnect lever, and so on are all right here. All organized, labeled, and ready to go when we put this battery back together here in just a few minutes. And then part of the bus bars and the controls of that battery, but I needed more table space, is the battery disconnect unit or the disconnect relay. It depends on whether you're looking in a parts book or a service manual or whatever. But basically we're looking at the negative and positive contactors our pre-charge contactor and our charging contactor, the pre-charge resistor, the current sensor and the bus bars and, and bolts and so on that put all of that together into this uh, entire battery disconnect relay assembly. Now, unfortunately, this assembly is not serviceable individually. You can't change individual parts. As far as I can tell by reading in the service information, it looks like a complete replacement of the entire assembly, which doesn't make any sense to me because it's not very hard to take this apart or put it back together. All right, the last group of parts that we'll look at before we put them back in the vehicle are the battery sections themselves. As you can see here, we have five battery sections. We have section one right here that has two battery modules in it section two, section three, section four, and section five. And of course, section five is normally stacked on top of section four uh, when it's back in the battery tray itself. And we will be looking at each one of these as we put them back together, back in the battery tray itself. The orange covers are covering the negative and positive terminals of each battery section. In each battery section, there are two battery modules. And the battery modules are either 40 volts or 32 volts, depending on which battery section we're talking about here. OK, we are going to start with the empty battery tray and start building it. Uh, in reverse order of, of how we took it apart, of course. So the first thing we need to put in are the insulated pads that went between the coolant plate and the bottom of this battery tray. All right, I've got the insulated pads here for going underneath the lower coolant plate, and then there's one more that goes underneath the upper coolant plate when we get that installed. These, if you recall from the disassembly video, had some double-sided foam tape that held them in place uh, here in the battery tray, so I'm just going to put another piece of 
foam tape in the same location or close to it and stick those back where they go. Here's the tape. Let's get these installed. Okay, now that we've got the insulation pads installed, we are ready to put the cooling plate back in, the lower cooling plate. So let's take a look at the cooling plate for a few minutes. Okay, as you can see here, I have the cooling plate, the lower cooling plate right here, and then the upper cooling plate I've just got sat on there so you can see where it's positioned. But here on the front of the cooling plate, we have our inlet hose that they call the battery cooling manifold inlet and then we have our outlet uh, hose right here. These tubes need to be removed before I put the battery tray uh, back in. I just put them on here so we could see where they are in relation to the, the cooling plate itself. And then also you can see the white thermal pads for each battery module. And there are 10 thermal pads, one for each of the 10 battery modules. And in the disassembly video, when we talked about these white thermal pads, uh, I told you that I thought that those had to be replaced. And so I called down to the local Chevrolet dealer. They tried to get them ordered for me. They were on a restricted parts uh, list to where I could not... Uh, buy them. They're about $30 a piece, $26 to $30, depending on if it's a large one or a small one. Um, and then they said, well, there's some committee that meets and decides who gets to have what parts, if anything. And they gave me the email address of the person to write to and ask to get these parts. Well, I, I wrote to them and no response. Um, so out of frustration, I decided, well, I'm going to go back and read the service information one more time and see what it says. And it, I was wrong. It actually does not say that you need to replace these. It just says to take them off when you're taking out the, the coolant plate and to put them back on uh, when you're installing the cooling plate. So as long as they're not damaged, as long as they're not dirty, and you can see I've, I've got them covered with a just plastic seat cover uh, material like you would put on any customer's seat uh, to prevent it, prevent it from getting dirty uh, when you're working on their car. But I just keep those, I've kept those covered up the whole time that I've uh, had them out of here. Uh, on the ones that I touched with dirty fingers, you could see my fingerprints in that material. And I just took some of that uh, gum remover, the uh, goof off or whatever brand name that yellow uh, liquid uh, gum and tar remover type uh, spray sprayed it on a paper towel and it wiped right off and it did not seem to damage the thermal plates at all they're still tacky these are not sticky but they're tacky and so you got to have clean hands uh, when you are going to remove them and i would highly recommend that you do not remove them that you only pull up whatever corner is necessary to disconnect the bolt or put the bolt back in if you ever have to remove a coolant plate or put, put one back on. Uh, normally, I don't think you would ever need to remove this coolant plate out of that battery tray unless the car had been in an accident and you were doing a repair. The upper coolant plate back there, though, for battery uh, section number five, uh, that plate would have to be removed if you were going to replace any of the following battery sections, battery sections three, four, or five, because you have to remove battery section five, the one on top, to get to battery section four, but you cannot get battery section three out without also taking out battery section four. So hope that you don't have a bad battery section three ever because it's a... <laughs> It's a lot of work. You got to take everything apart pretty much to uh, get that one out. But battery section one right here, battery section two, three, four, and then five on the top. Each section has two modules in it. And we'll look at the, when we get over to the batteries, we'll look at what module numbers are, are what. But it's just a big series circuit in a loop. Let's take a look at these thermal pads a little closer. 
as you can see right here, I'm just peeling up the seat cover material. I've washed my hand. And there's a bolt hole underneath this section of this thermal pad here for battery module 10. And I would recommend that you just simply peel that up and stick it to itself enough to take the bolt out or put it back in. And then when you're done, just lay it back down. Now it does tell you in the service information to make sure that there are no bubbles uh, in there when you lift one up and put it back down. And that's, these are very difficult. I did remove two of them on battery section five back there. Um, I took them all the way off and to put those back on, it's hard to do. They're very sticky. You can't slide them around at all to get them to uh, position, be positioned right. And it takes a little bit of practice to be able to lay one of those down and get it positioned where you want it. And then make sure you don't have any bubbles or, or wrinkles in the, in the thing. So we've got these 10 white thermal pads here. They do not have to be replaced as long as you treat them with care. Um, they appear to be reusable. And apparently you can't buy them right now. I saw an uh, article in the Automotive News uh, just cu a couple of days ago saying that Chevrolet is stepping up production of the Chevrolet Bolt EV uh, in preparation for the rush of EV buyers that want to buy it. And that's just going to make parts even harder to come by. Um, so that's one disadvantage of taking apart a battery uh, on a brand new vehicle is uh, I guess I was optimistic that I could just run down to the local dealer and buy parts for it. But luckily I haven't damaged anything and we are going to put this back together and put it back in the vehicle anyway. Okay, so let's take this coolant plate and take it over to the battery tray and set it in and get it bolted down. Okay, let's get those pipes off of there. Going to push down, squeeze in and lift up. Okay, we will very carefully move this over. Okay. Okay, now that we've got the cooling plate sat in the battery tray, there are 15 nuts that need to be put on studs to hold those two pieces together and then tighten to nine Newton meters or 80 inch pounds of torque. So as I mentioned before, we need to carefully peel up the thermal pad, carefully put the nut in place so that we don't drop it down into the, the battery tray itself. And then we will come around and torque these once we get all the nuts installed. Okay, the next things to install are what are called the battery tubes. They're the cross braces. And if you recall, we have four of them going across the battery. Each one has a certain position. I've marked 
and numbered each one with the arrow pointing forward. So this is the front of the battery. This is battery tube number one. I just need to get my plastic sheeting out from underneath it before we tighten any of these bolts. All the bolts on these battery tubes are also torqued to 9 newton meters or 80 inch pounds. Okay, the next piece to install is the X3 connector housing. That's our big DC high voltage, high current electrical connector right here. And so we'll, or the, it's, it's not the connector, it's the housing for it. Put that back in place. Its bolts are also torqued to the same 80 inch pounds or 9 newton meters. Okay, so the next parts to go on are the coolant poses, the coolant manifolds. This is the outlet, this is the inlet. There's a very large nut that a 1 and 5 eighths inch socket will fit. And the torque on these nuts is 30 inch pounds or 3.4 newton meters. So there's just quick connect fittings on the outside. There's a nut that holds the bracket down. It needs to be torqued to the 80 inch pounds or 9 newton meters. And then the big, the big nut on the inlet pipe. And then our outlet manifold goes next. Okay, 30 foot pounds. Right there. There we go. Okay, I just need to tighten this one nut on the stud that holds down the, the inlet manifold. Okay, we are ready to install the battery sections. Uh, but before we do that, we need to get a little more familiar with them. So let's go look at those next. Okay, I'm going to get our safety barriers out of the way so we can get in here and do some work. All right, to get familiar with these battery sections, the modules, the cell groups, uh, and the cells, uh, let's start with battery section number one here. Now, before everybody freaks out because I don't have personal protective equipment on, there's nothing dangerous about indivi these individual battery sections. I can touch, I can lean on, there, it's, there's a, a negative and a positive post right here, 40 volts. Uh, that's not dangerous. Uh, the requirements for personal protective equipment, the gloves, don't even occur until above 50 volts. So we're fine. We have a, a 40 volt section here. We have a 40 volt section there. Yeah, if we were to somehow hook them together, which they are never hooked together in the same battery section, then it would be 80 volts. So let's learn how they are hooked together and then we'll put them in the back in the battery uh, tray and hook the bus bars up which will make them dangerous make the voltages add together in series and uh, finish putting the battery together so this first battery section here this whole piece here is one piece it has four rods that go all the way through that have nuts on either side uh, you cannot disconnect or undo those nuts and take the rods out uh, without, just like on the Chevrolet Volt uh, battery sections, without these slightly pushing apart. And there's a circuit board on the side that I'll show you here in a few minutes that you will damage if you try to do that. So uh, unless you're going to unsolder the circuit board and take it off, uh, you would damage the battery uh, trying to take it apart any further than it is right now. This is, this is it, and I, I have done some studying. I, I cannot take these apart without ruining them, and since I can't buy any replacement parts at this time, I need these to work again 
uh, and go back in the vehicle for a, a summer workshop that I'm going to be teaching uh, here in June. Okay, so let's, let's zoom in and take a look here. This, as I mentioned, is battery section number one. And that's this entire battery width sitting here on the table. So from this end all the way across to that end is battery section number one. Now within battery section number one, there are two battery modules. We have battery module one, number one, right here. Let's zoom in and take a look at that. So we have battery module number one. That's these 10 battery cell groups, groups, and they're numbered one through 10. Cell group number one starts here at the negative battery terminal. So there's cell group number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way across to the positive battery terminal over here on this end. So cell groups one through ten, each of these has a nominal voltage of 3.65 volts, so that's 36 and a half volts, but fully charged, which I fully charged this battery with the level two plug-in charger that we have here on the wall uh, in the shop, and each cell now is around four volts a piece. That's where we get the 40 volts on these terminals. So this is battery module number one. Now, directly connected to it on the other side of the battery over here is battery section, or battery module, I'm sorry, number 10. So battery module 10, cell groups 87, starting here at the negative terminal, through 96 at the positive terminal. So battery module 1 is never connected to battery module 10. Battery module 1 hooks to battery module 2, which is directly behind it. And then battery module 2 hooks to battery module 3, and 3 hooks to 4, 4 hooks to 5, going straight back in the battery itself. And then coming back down the other side, we have 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 right here. So although we have five individual sections, the battery modules within each section are not connected to each other. They are totally separate independent batteries that just happen to be in the same section uh, is the correct uh, term there. We do not hook them together electrically, although they are hooked together mechanically, but they're insulated from each other electrically. We have, I've marked the negative and positive terminal on every battery module all the way through, and just like in a flashlight battery, we hook the positive terminal of one battery to the negative terminal of another one, and keep adding them together to increase the voltage. So if we have 40 volts in this section and we put it in series with battery uh, module two, then now we have 80 volts. And if we put that in series with battery module three, then we have 120 volts and so on, all the way around until we have 10 sections put together. However, uh, there are two 32 volt sections with only eight cell groups in them uh, in battery sections four and five. So it doesn't come out to be 400 volts. It comes out to be 300 and, I don't know, 85, 86, uh, somewhere around there. All right, well, let's take, a, let's take the side cover off of one of these battery sections. I have battery section five on the roll cart back here. So I'll roll it around and let's take a look at the makeup of these batteries as far as what can what else can we see besides the, the top and the, the sides and so on. We'll take the cover off of it. Okay, this is battery section five. This is the one that's stacked on top of battery section four underneath the back seat uh, in the vehicle. We And in battery section five, we have battery module five and battery module six because this is the end of the battery where it makes a U-turn in the series circuit and goes back up to the front of the battery to battery module 10. All right, now the battery energy control module, the computer inside of the battery itself, the battery housing itself, uh, monitors the voltage of each cell group in each battery module. 
and they monitor those voltages with an electrical connection. So we've got a connection over here for one side of the battery cells because the cells have an, a negative on one side and a positive on the other. They're laid out sideways. Now that's different than the Chevrolet Volt cell packs because they had both the positive and the negative terminals or connections at the top of the little pouch that I showed you in the Chevrolet Volt battery deep dive video that I shot last December. All right, now I have these little covers over the battery terminals. Here's the negative terminal, here's the positive terminal. Th these aren't really the correct tool to put over those. As a matter of fact, there's nothing listed to put over those. Um, these are little sleeves that are intended to slide over the end of a cable and protect it from conducting somewhere. But they, they work okay for covering those terminals, sort of. Uh, while they were stored out here in, in my uh, shop, uh, exposed. I didn't want people coming up and uh, messing with them or touching it. Uh, I didn't want a possibility of a tool rolling off and touching both sides and short-circuiting and, and so on. So it's good to keep, keep those covered up when, the, when they're not in use and be very careful when you're around them um, when you are working on them. Uh, this battery module right here, uh, cell, or battery module 5, has only eight cell groups in it. By the way, a cell group is just simply three cells welded together in parallel for increased uh, capacity. So there are three battery cells per group. There are 96 groups of cells in the entire battery. Each battery section is either going to have eight cell groups or 10 cell groups. Most of them have 10. As a matter of fact, there's only two that have eight. And that gives us a total of 288 individual cells. But remember, three of those are welded in parallel uh, with each other. So that breaks it down to 96 cell groups. So back here on battery section five, we have battery module five, battery module six, I told you that the battery energy control module, the BECM, needs to monitor the voltage of each cell group and that it does it through these electrical connectors here on each end of the battery. So there's on each battery section here, there are four of these connectors. Now there's a special service tool right here that has special little adapters that will come in there's one for the rear connector as far as how it's oriented in the vehicle and the other one for the front. And then we can put a multimeter in here just like on the Chevrolet Volt. This is the same tool I used on the Volt, it just has a different adapter cable for the battery section connectors. And we can put a, a voltmeter in here and select which cell we want to measure the voltage of, which we'll do here in a, in a few minutes. But I want to show you how those connectors are actually connected to the uh, ends of the battery cell groups. So there's this plastic cover on the side. It comes off. There we go. I'm going to take the cover off the opposite side so we can see both the positive and the negative end of each cell group. So let's zoom in here closer and take a look at the side of the battery now. Okay, so right here on this, let's see, this would be the rear side of battery module five. We have cell group 41, and this terminal I'm touching right here is the positive terminal of cell group 41. But if I turn this 
whole battery around now. Now we're looking at the negative side of cell group 41 right there. So from this side to this side is cell group 41. We have negative on this side, positive on the other. If I take my DC voltmeter and turn it on and go from battery negative of cell group 41 to battery positive of cell group 41, I get 4.056 volts. Okay, so let's look at how these cell groups are hooked together. So the negative terminal right here of battery module 5 is actually the negative terminal of cell group 41. On the opposite side, we have the positive terminal of cell group 41, and it's connected directly with a little copper bus bar there to the to the negative terminal of cell group 42. And then the positive terminal of cell group 42 is right here, as you can see. And then through this copper connection, connects to the negative terminal of cell group 43. So it's just making a big serpentine connection, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, eight cell groups of four volts each to give us 32 volts for this particular cell group, negative to positive, 32 volts. But if we come over here to this one that has 10 modules, negative to positive, we get 40 volts. All right, now taking these side covers off of the batteries is not an approved service procedure. Uh, there's possible damage, short circuits, and so on that could occur. Uh, by taking that off. And so to make it easier, since there's already this electrical connection right here, we have this special tool that I told you about. So now if I take the special tool and the multimeter and I plug in the positive and negative terminals, cell group 41, 4.056 volts. Cell group 42, 4.053. Cell group 44, 4.058. 45 is 4.055. 4 46, 4.054. 47, 4.054. And then the eighth cell group, 48, 4.048 volts. So it's a real quick and easy way to take voltage measurements without having to take the side uh, covers off and, and possibly causing harm uh, to yourself or tools or short circuits, harm in the battery and so on. So there's a special tool, of course, um, for taking those measurements. Now, of course, you can read those voltages on the scan tool, but this is part of a verification process that you would go through if you had a diagnostic trouble code that you were following through because maybe the voltage that you're reading on the scan tool was incorrect because of a poor electrical connection or an open circuit or something between the battery energy control module and the electrical connector here. So you would verify what the voltages really are at the battery versus what you could see on the, the GM MDI. Uh, to scan tool. Before we put the covers back on this battery, let's zoom in and look at a couple of more things. So in my previous videos on the Bolt EV battery removal and disassembly, I've had several comments asking if you could take the battery apart even further. Uh, and I told you earlier in this video that no, we cannot take it apart any further. Uh, a lot of you are interested in it for making a power wall for a solar uh, system and so on. Uh, I just wanted to show you what would be damaged if you tried to take this, take this apart. Okay, first, this green circuit board right here is soldered to these connections at the end of each uh, set of cell groups. And so uh, if you even undo these uh, nuts, the battery will start to expand, which can break the circuit board. So don't do that. Um, the only way I could figure out to 
possibly avoid that damage would be to come in and unsolder each of these connections here. So you've got a solder joint right there, another one right there, right there, right there, and right there. One, two, three, four, five of them on this side, and four uh, on the other. That you'd have to desolder to get that circuit board out, but then it seems to be riveted in place with plastic rivets uh, as well. You would also have the problem of each cell group is welded to some sort of a internal bus bar here. Uh, I don't know how you would break break that apart and still have it be usable. Uh, and then they are seem to be, be plastic uh, riveted or welded to the housing that the battery cells are inside of. It looks like that's what would happen if you try to disassemble it. But I'm not going to disassemble it, even though I would love to, without being able to have another one to put back in the vehicle to make it work. All right, so sorry to disappoint you there, but so let's put this back together and get these battery sections in the battery tray. We are just going to do them in numerical order. Battery sections one, two, three, four, and five, just like that. Okay, as you can see, battery section one weighs, well, the scale says 148 pounds, but we need to subtract about 11 pounds for the holding fixture. So 148 and a half minus 11, 137 and a half pounds approximately for battery section number one. Okay, let's take the plastic cover off of the thermal pads underneath battery section one and then set it down on and get it in place. Okay, the thermal pad is nice and clean underneath battery section one. Let's let it down. There we go. There's an alignment dowel on each end and then a hold down bolt stud in the middle on each side that lines up the center. All right, before we bring in battery section two, let's just take a few quick measurements of battery section one. It is 13 and a half inches wide by about 30, seven and three quarter inches long by about four and a fourth, 4.25 inches tall. All right, let's get the crane and bring in section two. Let's get the plastic off of the thermal pads for section two.
There's section number two, everything aligned. By the way, uh, section number two weighed 149 pounds, just half a pound more than battery section one, according to our scale. And of course, minus the 11 pounds for the, the holding fixture. Okay, let's remove the plastic for battery section three. So we're ready to lower battery section three. It weighs the exact same amount as battery section one. Um, the 148 and a half pounds on the scale minus the 11 pounds for the holding fixture. So 137 and a half pounds. All right, coming down slowly. Looking good. Right there. And finally, battery section four. Okay, battery section number four that I have here on the battery crane, it says it weighs 135 and a half pounds minus the 11 pounds for the holding fixture. So that's 123 and a half pounds for battery section four. And battery section five should be exactly the same, but we'll find out. All right, let's get the plastic off of thermal pads for battery section four. See if we can get this lined up. The crane is off center just a little bit. Looking good so far. Perfect. Okay, we've got battery sections one, two, three, and four sat in place, but they're still not bolted down or bracketed in place. And we cannot put on battery section five until we put on a bunch, whole bunch of brackets and a few wire harnesses and so on to uh, enable us to put the additional cooling plate on for battery section five and its insulated pad and the thermal pads and and so on before we set it in place. So I'm going to bolt down these battery sections next. The bolts that go through these brackets into the braces, the battery tubes as they're called, they don't line up easily and they don't, uh, they're, they're very difficult to get started. I had to start every single one of them uh, by hand, which of course I normally would do anyway, but to line the long bolt up with the hole down below is a little more challenging than I was expecting. Okay, I'm going to go around with my electric gun and run the nuts down to where they touch. I'm not going to torque them with these. I'll use the torque wrench.
Okay, torque wrench time. Okay, now that we have all 56 bolts and nuts that hold down battery sections one through four installed and torqued properly, the next thing we need to install are the voltage sensing wire harnesses for battery section number four here. Now we have to install those right now because there are brackets that will go on and cover those up here in just a moment as we prepare to put on battery section five which sits on top of battery section four here. So let's get these wire harnesses installed. These are just the voltage cell sensing lines that the battery energy control module uses to monitor the voltage on each of those cells. So there's a connector that plugs in to the back with a connector position assurance clip and one in the front. And then two little harness retainers that hold those in place. And then we've got one more for the other side. Connector, connector position assurance clip, connector, clip, and a couple of harness retainers. Okay, the next pieces to install are the supports for battery section 5, as well as the battery cooling plate for section 5. And so we'll set those on there right now. We're just going to set them on loose without putting the... Uh, nuts in place or tightening anything down because you've got to put on both sides of these supports and the big metal plate that goes across here and get all these studs lined up before you put any uh, bolts or nuts in and tighten them down. So this is the big heavy support plate for battery section 5. I'll bet this thing weighs 10 pounds. Uh, it's got some uh, little foam pads on the back that face down against battery section four. So let's get it on and lined up with studs in the front, the back, and the corners of each side. All right, now we can put the nuts on. Okay, now we torque all of these to the same 9 newton meters or 80 inch pounds. Okay, the next piece is the insulation pad for cooling plate number 5. I've got the double sided sticky tape installed right there. And we'll just set that in place right there. Okay, next up is the cooling plate for battery section five. We've got the two thermal pads here, the thermal transfer pads to transfer the heat out of section five into the cooling plate, the aluminum plate. The aluminum plate, as you can see, has coolant passages uh, that the coolant will go through. It comes in on these two outside uh, fittings and then goes out on this inside fitting. So it goes on next. There are three nuts that hold down this cooling plate. So we will just peel back the thermal pad a little bit. Get these two nuts on on this side and torqued to spec. And they are the same nine newton meters and then there's one on the other side okay next we will install the hose clamps for the coolant transfer tubes going up to coolant plate for section battery section five okay we are ready to put battery section five on but we need to remove the plastic 
from the thermal pad. Okay, I'm ready to set battery section 5 down on the thermal pads, but I noticed that th the thermal pad over on the passenger side has a bubble uh, in it, and so I'm going to slowly peel that up and try to put it back down and get rid of that bubble. If you recall from the disassembly video, I pulled these pads all the way off because the service information said to remove the pads. But <laughs> since uh, you can't buy them, at least at the moment, and there really is no reason to replace them unless they're damaged, I would highly recommend that you do not remove these pads. You only just peel them up enough to get the bolts out or nuts out and put them back on. And that way we're not dealing with stretching the pads. It, they feel like they're just a little bit bigger than they were when I uh, took them off. Uh, and that way you're not dealing with uh, trapped air bubbles underneath, which will decrease the thermal transfer efficiency from the battery pack to the cooling plate itself. So I'm going to see if I can get that bubble out of there before we set the battery section 5 back down. I've washed my hands too to make sure that they're clean. That looks better. All right, let's bring in section 5. Okay, as you can see here on the crane scale, it is displaying 135 and a half pounds. The battery lifting tool weighs 11 pounds approximately. So that's 124 and a half pounds or about 56 and a quarter kilograms that battery section number five weighs, which is almost exactly what battery section four weighs with my fairly inexpensive uh, crane scale that only has a resolution of half a pound. So um, let's get battery section number five sat down in place now. Okay, let's bring it down real slow. Get everything lined up. Looks good on this side. Looks good over here. We got the alignment dials. We are good. Okay, next we've got some brackets that go in the front of battery section five to hold it down and to give us some mounting studs for the cover for this battery section number five. So we'll set those in place, but we will not put any bolts or nuts in place yet. Okay, next up is the battery cover, the upper plate for battery section five. We'll set it on over those studs. Just like that. And then we have two rear brackets We'll hold that in place. Just like that. All right, then a whole bunch of nuts and bolts. Okay, let's torque everything to the same 9 newton meters, 80 inch pounds. Okay, now that everything is bolted down, all the battery sections, every bracket, everything is bolted down uh, that is not related to high voltages. Uh, it's time to get on our personal protective equipment, our class zero 1000 volt uh, insula insulation gloves with the outer leather protectors here. And it's time to take off the battery terminal 
covers here and start hooking up the bus bars to increase the voltage by putting all of these batteries in series with each other. Okay, it's time to hook up these bus bars that connect each battery module in series. So we are going to start with battery module number one, which is right here. And battery module number one has a positive post right here that we are going to connect with the negative post of battery module number two with this bus bar. We'll come back and put the nuts on here in a moment. Then battery module two has a positive post right here that we will connect with the negative post of battery module three. Just like that. Then battery module three has a positive post that we will connect to the negative terminal of battery module four. Right there. And then battery module four has a positive post that we will connect to the negative post of battery module number five with this bus bar. It has a couple of little clips that we need to snap into place. There we go. So that's positive from battery module four to negative of battery module five. Then connecting positive of battery module five to negative of battery module six, we have our service plug lever connector. The one that disconnects the battery right in the middle and that is going to sit right there. Okay, then we have the positive of batter battery module six the hooks to the negative of battery module seven. Just like this. Then we have the positive of battery module seven the hooks to the negative of battery module eight. Just like that. Then we have the positive of positive of battery module eight that connects to the negative of battery module nine. Just like that. And then we have the positive of battery module nine that hooks to the negative of battery module 10. Just like that. So it's a giant series circuit in the shape of the letter U as viewed from the top. And it is split right in the middle with the service disconnect lever. So when you pull that out, we're open circuiting a series circuit right in the center of this battery. Now that leaves us with an overall battery negative terminal, which is the negative terminal for battery module number one, right here and an overall positive terminal, which is the positive terminal of battery module 10 right here. And those hook to the contactors, the relays, that connect or disconnect the two big heavy wires that go to the inverter, uh, converter assembly and the quick charge, fast charge uh, system underneath the hood. So let's get the nuts put on all of these and torque to spec. All right, I'm not going to put the nuts on our disconnect lever connector yet because I have to hook a little a low voltage uh, wire harness to it, the uh, interlock circuit before I bolt that down. Okay, we will torque these to the same nine Newton meters, 80 inch pounds. OK, 
Okay, next on the list is to install the low voltage wire harness. If you recall, it has the two electrical connections right up in here in the front of the battery to communicate with the computers outside the battery. And then it goes all the way to the back of the battery and connects to the battery energy control module and a few other things. So let's get this hooked up here. Oh, our temperature sensors are part of this circuit. Okay, so we'll get the harness clipped into place on the bracket. We've got a temperature sensor right here for battery section 10, or battery module 10. No temperature sensor for battery module 9. We do have a temperature sensor for battery module 8. A temperature sensor for battery module 6 right here in the top in section 5. Looks like we've got a ground wire we've got to hook up to a stud. Temperature sensor for battery module 4. Five. Temperature sensor for battery module 2. Another temperature sensor for battery module number 1. Interesting. So temperature sensors for 1, 2, 5, 6, 8, and 10. Okay, here in the back of the battery on battery section 5 is our service disconnect connector. And there's a hole right here for this little wire harness, a two-wired, two-terminal connector to come up and connect in. And this is the interlock circuit. So there's a little clip I have to lift up. Looks like I've got it lifted up and then we insert this in place, clip it back down and now we're ready to put the, the nuts on the studs. The purpose of that little two wire interlock circuit is to detect when the service plug uh, lever has been removed. Okay, to finish up the low voltage harness, all I have to do is put the screws in the two electrical connectors here that stick through the battery case. All right, now that we've got the low voltage harness installed, now there are two high voltage voltage sensing harnesses that connect to the ends of every battery section here. So we'll start here with the left hand harness. Okay, got the rear connector, connector position assurance clip on battery module six here and the front connector and assurance clip then we've got the little pass-through harness that goes to battery section four to the high voltage sense lines that we have already connected okay there's the left hand harness Let's get the right one in. Okay, we've got the low voltage harness on. We've got both high voltage, voltage sensing harnesses on. Now it's time to bring out the BECM, the Battery Energy Control Module. We'll take a look at it, and then we'll connect it 
to these harnesses and if you recall there's a special order to disconnect the harness and reconnect the harness so that we do not damage the balancing circuits inside of the BECM. So let's take a look at the BECM next. Okay this is the battery energy control module and for those of you who have seen my Chevrolet Volt 2018 Chevrolet Volt battery deep dive video you'll recognize this BECM because it looks just like the one uh, in the Volt that I've got the battery sitting right over here uh, other than it doesn't have the foam pads on the outside of it to uh, support the upper battery cover but it has the same electrical connectors uh, the same connector numbers uh, and if you look closely here at each connector we have connector number seven and connector number eight. These two bottom connectors on each side, these are the low voltage uh, harness connectors. And then the rest of these are the voltage sensing lines for the left side of the battery and the right side of the battery. So you can see uh, the X1 connector right here is for cells one through 16. And the X2 would be uh, 16 through 33. And you'll notice there's a crossover there, and that's because they need to monitor, they have to have a reference voltage to monitor the next cell. So 16 through 33 there, 33 through 48 here, cells 48 through 64 in connector 4 here, connector 5 is 64 through 80, and connector 6 is 80 through 96. So what's kind of funny though is if you take the screws out of the the back of this and and take a look at it here right here in this upper right hand corner it reads lg cam ltd vitm for volt generation 2 and it has a date of 2014 may 9th so right there in that bottom corner it actually says volt uh, that this was for the volt uh, but obviously they're using it for the the bolt and it's just a 96 uh, battery cell uh, monitoring and balancing uh, computer so that's it it's okay it I just thought it was funny that it said volt on it when it actually came out of a bolt um, so that's the uh, front of the circuit board there and there is the back so let me put the screws back in this and we will get this hooked to the back of the battery here and connect the wire harnesses to it okay we are here to the back of the battery on top of battery section 5 ready to install the BECM and I want to read to you the warning right out of the service information about disconnecting and reconnecting the BECM. So uh, here it is right here. The battery energy control module's internal cell balancing circuitry is powered by the cell group voltage sense circuits. So it's, it's even though it's, we're not hooked to the vehicle, it's self-powered. In order to prevent an unrecoverable, unbalanced hybrid EV battery section or internal control module damage, always take the following actions. And there's three things. Disconnect all of the battery energy control modules prior. And there's three things. Disconnect all of the battery energy control module connectors prior to disconnecting the voltage sense lines. Number two, reconnect all of the hybrid battery section connectors prior to reconnecting the BECM harness connectors. So we've done that. And finally, number three, um, disconnect and reconnect the BECM connectors only in the sequence provided in the repair instructions. So for reassembly, Let me get the BECM inserted into its bra brackets here. Right there. The 
first harnesses we connect are the high voltage harnesses not the low voltage ones and the first one is this x6 connector so we will plug it in with its little connector position assurance clip and then these two next in order from the middle outward Oh, come on. There we go. And then this upper one on the other side, or the front one on the other side. And then the one right next to it. And then the last one. All right, so those are the high voltage connectors. And then we connect the low voltage ones. Oh, I didn't hook up this uh, ground circuit here. Uh, let me do that real quick. I don't think it makes any difference in this case, but I'm not going to take a chance on it. Because it might. All right, then the last two connectors, we've got the low voltage one on this side is number seven to plug in. And the one over here, number eight, is the last one. Now, I have to admit that in my 2018 Chevrolet Volt battery deep dive, I didn't, I'm not sure that I disconnected those in the proper order because in the service information, I saw the warnings to disconnect the, the BECM first uh, when you're taking everything apart and then disconnect the others. But I did not see or pay attention, apparently, to the warning of the proper order that they should be disconnected in. And so I, I'm not sure that I disconnected them in the proper order. And I went back and looked at the video and I did not reconnect them in the proper order. So it will be interesting to see if I've damaged uh, anything on the reassembly of that Volt uh, battery. Um, either way, we'll uh, get it fixed and, and get it working again here uh, shortly. Um, but I made sure that on this one that I disconnected it and reconnected it in the proper order. So very important. Uh, that is not something that I would have thought of, uh, and I wonder if it's if that's true on more than just the General Motors um, LG battery monitoring circuits or, or not. So to just go in and rip things apart, uh, you can actually cause damage and not even realize it. The last thing to install is the relay assembly the contactors uh, in the front of the battery before we put the battery seal on and the front or the upper cover on uh, we also have to leak check the cooling system which i've got special tools and adapters to do that and then once we get the cover on we have to use uh, what's called a smoke machine a smoke test to make sure there's no leaks in the entire housing assembly because we don't want moisture or dust or anything to get inside of this over the life of the vehicle. And that's one reason I did not put the Chevrolet Volt battery back together or put the, uh, the housing on it and put it back in the car yet uh, and have a video on that is because I was waiting for the proper adapters to show up and they have. So uh, that will be coming up here uh, pretty soon of putting the cover back on the Volt battery and smoke testing and coolant leak checking and and then putting it back in the car just like this bolt ev all right well let's take a look at the contactor uh, assembly or the relay assembly or the battery disconnect unit depending on whether you're looking in the service manual or the 
uh, training information or the parts manual. There, there can actually be three different names for the same part, which can be quite confusing. Which is why I like to know how does the thing work. I don't care what they call it. If we know how it works, then uh, that can help us with the diagnostics. All right, let's go take a look at that. All right, in the front of this battery is the high voltage battery disconnect relay center, also known as the battery disconnect unit. Unfortunately, this entire assembly, if anything goes wrong with any of the four contactors inside or the resistor or uh, fuse or current sensor, you have to replace the whole thing from what I can tell. I, I could be wrong, but I cannot see any procedures in the GM service information to replace anything inside of here. It's just the entire assembly, which is kind of strange because on the Volt, uh, you can replace individual pieces. It's, it's quite nice, actually. But that's just how it is. But if you've seen any of my previous videos, you know that I like to take things apart that I'm not supposed to take apart, as long as I can still put them back together and have them functional. So I have totally disassembled the battery disconnect um, relay center here or battery disconnect unit as it's called and we're going we are going to reassemble it here looking at the individual pieces so inside of this battery disconnect unit there are some major pieces that are common to any electric vehicle or even a, a hybrid electric vehicle um, we have two some people call them relays some people call them contactors but we have two great big heavy duty contactors. We have one that's called the negative contactor, one that's called the positive contactor. And these are the devices that connect our high voltage battery positive and negative to those two great big heavy orange wires that connect to the front of the battery. We have to have something that disconnects the physical battery, the, high, the voltage of the battery from the outside of the battery that is the job of these two pieces. We have one for the negative terminal of the battery and one for the positive terminal. So those just sit inside of here. Uh, we have the one on the negative side that sits right over here and one for the positive side that sits right here. Then we have another smaller version of the same thing a contactor this one's called the pre-charge contactor and the pre-charge contactor always has an accompanying pre-charge resistor this particular resistor is rated at 80 watts and 70 ohms and it's an 80 watt resistor it has cooling fins it, it can get fairly hot uh, but this is only used during the initial power up of the bolt ev when you hit the power button and, and turn it on so before we can close both the p positive and negative contactors here and just connect the battery to those cables we have to do it in a specific manner so that we don't create arcing or any damage inside of these contactors uh, or inside of the inverter assembly inside the or underneath the hood so instead what we do is we close the positive contactor first and instead of closing the negative contactor next we close the the pre-charge contactor which basically does the same thing as the negative contactor but it does it through this resistor so it will create a low current path for current to go into the inverter assembly where there is a large smoothing capacitor that is used to smooth out the voltage pulsations during acceleration that the IGBTs create. It's also used to smooth out the voltage pulsations that the full wave rectifier bridge creates when you decelerate and have regenerative braking or uh, just generation of uh, power when you decelerate. So this will slowly charge that capacitor. When that capacitor gets charged, and when I say slowly, I don't mean over a couple of minutes or even over a couple of seconds. It's, it's over uh, so many milliseconds rather than instantly. But by time the smoothing capacitor charges, the voltage level on each side of the negative contactor is zero. 
and it won't be zero until that smoothing capacitor is charged. Well, if we have zero volts on each side of this contactor, we can close it and there will be no arcing and the contactor will uh, survive. So that's the purpose of the pre-charge contactor and resistor is to prevent damaging the negative contactor in this case. Now some electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, they do it just the opposite. They close the negative and they use the pre-charge on the positive. It doesn't matter. Whichever one it, it does, that, that's what it does. It charges that uh, smoothing capacitor that they all have in the uh, inverter. Okay, so the pre-charge contactor sits right here and the pre-charge resistor fits right down in this slot right here and locks it into place. All right, now, this electric vehicle, like many electric vehicles, will have a fourth contactor. And this one is called the charging system contactor. So basically what this does is when you plug in your vehicle using a level one charger or a level two charger, the J1772 compliant charge connector, this contactor will close instead of the positive contactor and it will allow an alternate current path for DC current to come in and charge the battery at a lower current rate than through the uh, big two wires that connect to the front of the battery. If you have the fast charger option on your Bolt EV and you plug in the, the fast charger, then, then this contactor is still here, but it's not used. Instead, we will close the positive contactor and let the two big heavy orange wires run higher amounts of current into the battery to charge it. So we use the charging system positive contactor. If we're using the level one or level two charger, we use the big positive contactor to charge the battery when we're using the fast charger. All right, then we also have a current sensor, and this is on the negative side of the uh, relay assembly here. It measures the current. Uh, on the, in the negative circuit, which is the same as in the positive circuit. It's a big series circuit. Uh, this current sensor has a low resolution signal and a high resolution signal, and it depends on the, what, how much current is going through as to which increments they use. And so there is a bus bar that goes through there for the negative current, negative cable of the battery. And that sits over here on this other side of this uh, big relay center. So we've got four contactors and a resistor. Uh, there's also a fuse that goes in the charging circuit for the uh, level one and level two charging. This is a 40 amp, 450 volt fuse. Uh, if it blows, apparently you got to replace the whole, the whole thing. Um, but if it blows, you've got a problem, so you better <laughs> better figure out what's going on there. But that fuse is located over here on the passenger side of the relay center. All right, so those are the major components. Now the rest of the pieces in here are just the little wire harnesses and bus bars to connect all of that together. So let's let's get those connected. So we've got a big bus bar here for the negative terminal. So over here on the passenger side of the uh, relay center, we have our current sensor and the bus bar that connects to the overall negative terminal of our high voltage battery and then hooks it to the negative contactor over here. Then we've got this wire harness that feeds current from our plug-in charger to the contactor for the plug-in charger. And then we've got another little wire harness that connects to our positive contactor and the charging system contactor. Now we can bolt down these contactors. There are no torque specs for these bolts since 
they're not really serviceable. I tried to use a torque wrench to measure how much torque it took to loosen them, but it was so low that um, I couldn't get a good reading. So just hand tied is all I'm tightening those two. Okay, we'll get our pre-charge contactor bolted down and our charging system contactor. Now we can connect our little wire harness to our charging system contactor. Hook our bus bars up to our negative contactor through the pre-charged resistor harness. And we've got a bus bar for our positive contactor. Okay, next we have our overall battery positive terminal connection to the contactors. And this will connect the positive contactor to the positive terminal of our big high voltage battery pack that we just reassembled. Now I will have to take this back off before we put it back on the the battery, but I just want to show you where everything connects. I think it'll help you understand how it works. All right, then we have our overall battery negative terminal over here on the other side that connects through the negative contactor, and it sits right here. So these two are the inputs. We have our positive and our negative. The negative goes through the current sensor that goes to our negative contactor that then, once that negative contactor closes, we have a negative terminal output right here that sticks out the front of the battery and goes to the two big heavy orange wires at the front of the battery. And then we have our positive terminal of the battery that connects to the positive contactor. And once it closes, it feeds current to the positive terminal here that connects to our big heavy orange wire under the vehicle. Just like that. All right, there's a couple of screws that hold the current sensor in place. And then we've got four nuts, two that hold the fuse down and connect it to the charger, positive, and one that connects to the charger, negative. And the third or the fourth one over here picks up uh, negative from the outside negative terminal there on the big heavy orange wires. Okay, so those are all the components but we have to control these somehow. And the BECM that we just installed on the battery is in control of these. So there's a low voltage harness right here that has to be installed. We have a connection. We have to be able to read the current off the current sensor. We have to be able to control all four contactors. And so we have this harness that goes on next. Okay, we are completely reassembled. So let's look at the overall operation one more time. We have battery negative from the overall battery right here, battery positive from the battery over here. So that's our 350 or so uh, volts uh, nominal. Uh, these, this negative terminal needs to be able to connect to this output negative terminal and it's an open circuit between those two points until we close the negative contactor. The positive terminal over here needs to connect to the positive output terminal right here, and that's accomplished through this positive contactor. But as I mentioned before, we can't just simply close both of these contactors and have everything work right. Um, there's a surge of current that would go into the capacitor uh, of the inverter assembly that uh, unrestricted without a resistor uh, could damage it. And so we need to slow that current down. Also, that 
that rush of current could cause an arcing to take place in these contactors which can damage them. So we close the positive contactor first, then we close the pre-charge contactor, which is just a mini negative contactor, through the pre-charge resistor here to slow down the current, wait for that capacitor to charge. Once it's charged, then we have zero volts on each side of this con negative contactor. We can then close it and release the pre-charge contactor and we're good to go. Now, when we connect the charger to the vehicle, and remember there's two ways to charge this vehicle, we have the, the plug-in uh, level one and level two chargers that are relatively slow to charge the battery. Uh, it could be, well, a level two charger, when I plug this in, uh, it said it would take nine and a half hours to charge it once we received this, this vehicle brand new. Those chargers send AC current to a special box underneath the hood uh, called the charger module of, uh, or something like that. It then has a special connector at the front of the battery that has a positive and a negative terminal that connect right here. The negative terminal right here just has a wire that comes over to this negative uh, terminal from the battery that connects then through the negative contactor and establishes a connection to the battery uh, modules. The positive terminal here through this fuse then has a wire that comes over to our uh, charger contactor that when it closes bypasses the positive contactor through this wire and charges the battery but at a lower rate of current. And when using a level one or a level two charger we still use the pre-charge contactor in that whole uh, sequence of events because these two terminals are still connected to the inverter and that capacitor still needs to be charged every time you uh, power up the vehicle. Now that capacitor discharges uh, when you turn the vehicle off because there's a resistor in parallel with it that will discharge it. All right and then the second way to charge the vehicle is with the fast charger and that is where we use these two terminals and the two uh, the positive and the negative uh, contactors and the pre-charge contactor. The pre-charge contactor is always used uh, to supply higher amounts of current, much larger terminals on the positive and negative contactors than on the pre-charge contactor. This is for the small amounts of current uh, to charge the battery. This one is rated at 40 amps, the, the charger contactors. I don't know if you're getting 15 amps or 30 amps or whatever it is on the Bold EV when you plug in a level one and, or level two uh, charger. I, I forgot to look that up, but it uses these smaller terminals uh, when you use the level one or level two. The larger terminals here are for the fast charge uh, option, and I have not looked up what that current is either. So if you, any of you viewers know how much current is used on uh, either of those or any of those three charge options, uh, put it in the text box uh, or the comment box down below. Let me know, and I appreciate that. Okay, well, this thing is ready to go back in the front of the battery, and then we pressure test the, the cooling system to make sure there's no leaks, and then we put the seal on and the cover on and smoke test the system to make sure there's no leaks in the housing. So let's put this back on next. Okay, before we put the battery relay center back in, I want to hook up the cooling system pressure tester because it has to stay pressurized for several minutes to check for leaks. So the cooling system pressure test procedure has us hook up the same two adapters that we used when we used vacuum to pull the coolant out of the cooling plates, except now we are going to use a, them to pressurize the system. And it tells us to pressurize it to no higher than the pressure on the, uh, the reservoir cap, which I looked is five PSI or 35 K, KPA. We will hook up these adapters to the coolant fittings here on the front of the, the battery. So there's one. There's the other one. Put the clip back on so we can pressure test it and not have it 
pop out. Then we use a, a standard radiator pressure tester. Uh, we are only going to go to 5 psi, but we need to be able to connect this to that little uh, outlet there. And so there's a radiator cap tester adapter that we'll put on. And then there's an adapter to go to the small size that's on the fitting on the battery there that we'll put on next. And then there's an adapter to connect this fitting to the fitting on the battery. Okay, there we go. Now we pressurize it to 5 PSI. There's a lot of area in here, so it's going to take a, a lot of pumping to get us to 5. Okay, we're sitting at 5 right there, 4, and then we'll keep an eye on that and see if we have any leaks. Okay, let's put this relay center in. Okay, to put the relay center back in, I have to take back off this one bus bar. Uh, if you recall from the uh, battery disassembly video, this bus bar is right in the way of getting a nut off of the relay center here. Uh, let me just double check. Actually, maybe not. We might be okay. So there's some studs that hold the relay center to the battery. Uh, lower uh, case here. Oh, I know why we have to take that bus bar off. Uh, we won't be able to get a torque wrench on the nut to hold it in place. So let's take that take that back off. Let's see how we're doing on our pressure here. Looks like it's holding well. Okay, we'll take that bus bar off. And then our overall positive battery cable to the contactor. Oh, no, we can't do that yet. We've got to torque down the relay center to the battery case first. Okay, so those are the relay center bolts, nuts. Now we can put the bus bar back on. Get it torqued. All right, now we can put on our battery positive overall cable. Plug in our low voltage harness. We can put on our overall negative cable. Looks like I'm missing one bolt. There we go, find it. Let's check our cooling system pressure. Still holding good. Okay, we'll hook up our negative terminal, which is our output and input here at the front of the battery next. We will come back and torque all of these here in a minute. And then our positive terminal output. Right there. All right, I'm missing one bolt. Okay, found the missing bolt for our negative strap over here. I know the torque on these battery bus bars, but I don't know the torque on these contactors. And our terminal output, so let me go look that up. Okay, as it turns out, they're all the same. Nine newton meters or 80 inch pounds. All right, let's check on our cooling system. Pressure test, still holding. Uh, and all the service information tells us is that they need to hold, it needs to hold for two minutes. So we've been a lot more than two minutes. So I think we're safe to say that we don't have any leaks. All right, the next part we put on is the uh, big X3 electrical connector on the front of the 
the battery here. We'll get our cooling system pressure tester off of here now. Okay, we are just about done here. The last part that we need to put on is our charge electrical connector when we use the level one or the level two uh, charger. So this is, this comes in over here on the passenger side. Has four bolts that hold it in place. Get these torqued to the same <laughs> nine newton meters, 80 inch pounds. And then there's just a few, we've got the two wires, the DC positive and negative from our charger that we need to hook up inside on the relay center. The orange wire with the black stripe is the DC ground. The orange wire with no stripe is the DC positive. The same nine newton meters, 80 inch pounds. Okay. <laughs> what an adventure to totally disassemble this Bolt EV battery, investigate all the pieces, figure out what every piece does in here, label everything, figure out the electrical circuitry. Uh, it's, that's a lot of fun. And uh, the next thing we need to do is put the orange cover over the relay center and bolt it down. And then we've got the seal around the whole outside of the battery. And then the cover, the upper battery cover that goes on next. But I'm here all by myself and there is no one to help me set that cover down on. So that you will have to just imagine that <laughs> we're putting the cover on and I will shoot a separate video on smoke testing the Bolt EV battery housing for leaks using an evaporative emission smoke test machine and we'll do the same thing with the Chevrolet Volt 2018 Volt battery over there because that's we're waiting on that's what we were waiting on uh, with that also so so let's do just one quick overview of the entire battery uh, system and then we'll be done. Okay, starting here at battery module number one, negative overall terminal of the entire battery, I'm going to take my DC voltmeter and connect it right to the negative terminal. All right, then if I come over here to the positive terminal, I get 40.57 volts. And what I'm going to show you is that this entire battery is in series. So we have 40 volts there. If we go to the next battery to its positive terminal, now we're 40 volts higher, 81.2. Then if we go to the next battery, which is battery module three, so battery modules one, two, and three, these are all 40 volts each. Now we're at 121 volts. And then if we go to battery module four, to its positive terminal, 162 volts, so four times 40 volts approximately. Then battery module five to its positive terminal, and this time we're not adding 40 volts, we're adding 32 more volts. So 194, 195 volts approximately. So that's half of our battery voltage. And that's where our service disconnect uh, lever and connector is under the back seat. And when we unplug that, we split the battery in two. So we have two 195 volt batteries in series with each other at that point. So now, if we plug that in, and come over here to the positive terminal, now we get the 235 volts that we would expect. 
Okay, and then if we go down to battery module 7's positive terminal, we're going to add another 32 volts, and now we're at 267 volts. And then we go to battery module 8, add another 40 volts, now we're at 308 volts. Then battery module 9's positive terminal, add another 40 volts, now we're at 348.9 volts. And then finally, battery module 10, add another 40 volts, and our overall system voltage, fully charged, is 389.5 volts right now. And that's, I fully charged the battery before uh, taking the battery out, which I should not have done. <laughs> It's safer to leave it at a lower voltage. But it is what it is. So hopefully that helps you see how these batteries are in series with each other. And then if we go to the contactors here, now if we hook our multimeter to the battery side of the contactors, so there's the negative, here's the positive, there's our 389 volts, just like we measured off of the battery itself. But now if we go to the output side of the contactors, we have zero volts. And that shows us that the contactors are open. And that's the same as the zero volts that we would have here in the front of the battery, zero volts, because the contactors are, when they're in functioning condition, uh, should be open whenever the 12 volt system is disconnected. But we've got the positive contactor, the negative contactor, the pre-charge contactor, and the charging system contactor. Any of those that don't uh, open like they should when you disconnect the 12 volt system could still give you uh, either full system voltage or half uh, of a connection to the um, the battery, which would still read zero, but it would, could be a little more dangerous. So hopefully that helps you to understand the, the function of the battery, contactors, the relay center, whatever they want to call it, in relationship to the battery uh, itself. Well, uh, this has been very interesting. It's been a lot of work, but I've really enjoyed it. And I hope you have too. Uh, thank you for watching.